I'm Rick Edelman, and this is The Truth About Money. On today's show... Well, there's a new four-letter word in Washington. It's called math. You stumped me. Go to your room. <laughs> it's not a rumor, it is in the law. That's all coming up on the program right here, right now, on The Truth About Money. This program is funded in part by TD Ameritrade, an investment firm that believes investors deserve guidance and support as they pursue their individual goals. TD Ameritrade provides them with resources, education, and a wide range of investment solutions. TD Ameritrade, committed to investors, independent registered investment advisors, and their success. Here's a quick little quiz in basic arithmetic. You're going to buy coffee and a muffin for $1.10. The coffee is a dollar more than the muffin. So, how much does the muffin cost? We posed this question to people out on the street, and here are the answers they gave. Well, I want to say 10 cents, but I have a feeling that's going to be wrong. 10 cents, right? Wait, you said it's a dollar 10 total. Dollar 10 total. The coffee's a dollar more than the muffin. Well, the muffin, it was the muffin a dollar 10, or the coffee and the muffin were a dollar 10? 10 cents. You stumped me. Ten cents! A dime. I'm getting it. Dollar ten. You said that the muffin is a dollar more, or coffee is a dollar more than the muffin. The muffin's ten cents. Seventy-five cents. I don't know. It's gotta be ten cents. It's only a dollar ten. You said for the total. The coffee was a dollar and the muffin was ten cents. <laughs> I'm a mortgage investor for a large major bank. Now you can see the problems that we're in. <laughs> it's obvious the answer is a nickel. We make hundreds of decisions every day, usually in a hurry. Chicken or pasta? Take the highway or a back road? Wear a solid tie or none at all? Time is short, so we make decisions quickly by following our intuition, our gut. Most of the time we make good decisions, but sometimes, though, our gut is wrong and that's usually the case with financial decisions. That's because most of those decisions involve math, and most of us, let's face it, well, we stink at math. This coffee and muffin question is a great example of how our intuition fails us. You're probably like the folks we talk to. You think that if the coffee costs a dollar more than the muffin, then the muffin must cost 10 cents. Wrong. The correct answer is a nickel. Seriously get a paper and pen to prove it to yourself. Just about everybody gets this question wrong, and that's because, just like you, most people listen to their intuition, and our intuition gives us the wrong answer. Scientists call this intuition bias, and it affects almost all of us. When we're faced with a question, we react instinctively. We don't take the time to do the arithmetic, so instead, we trust our gut. Unfortunately, our gut, or intuition bias, causes us to make bad financial decisions. Think about your retirement plan at work. Say your boss matches your contributions, but only up to 3%. If you put in one, he puts in one. If you put in three, he puts in three. But if you put in 10, he still only puts in three. So what's the best amount for you to put in? If your intuition says three, your intuition is wrong. You see, your goal is to accumulate as much as you can for retirement, and that means you need to save as much as you can. So even though you're contributing 10, not 3, it makes sense even though your boss only matches on 3. Mistakes like this cost investors like you hundreds of thousands of dollars. Where else in your life are you letting your intuition lead you down the wrong path? Watch out for intuition bias. It can make a mess of your finances. Here's what you've been waiting for, the chance to prove you're a financial whiz, our quiz of the day. To pay for your child's college education, you should get a home equity loan, apply for student loans, hope your child is a top athlete, save in a 529 plan. 
My producers wanted to talk to grandparents to see if they had any questions about personal finance, and to find them, you know where they went, Miami Beach. Hi, Rick. I just want to know, I have got a grandson, and we're having a granddaughter that's coming on the way. Should we be putting away for their future? Today's grandparents are often more affluent than those of a generation ago, and that gives them the opportunity to be a little more generous financially with their grandchildren than prior generations were able to do. And that's terrific. There are a couple of things to consider if you're a grandparent wanting to provide financial support to grandchildren. You have two fundamental choices. One is college planning. The other one is retirement planning a notion that not too many grandparents have given consideration of when it comes to grandchildren. We offer you a lot of great information at thetruthaboutmoneytv.com to give you ideas on how to save for both your grandchild's college and your grandchild's retirement. But let me just mention one other final point to give you some guidance when dealing with financial support of grandchildren. Keep a couple of things in mind. Number one, are you sure that the grandchildren you currently have are all the grandchildren you're ever going to have? You might have one or two or three grandkids today, but you might have more coming in years to come. So make sure that whatever financial support you create to, for today's grandchildren, you can replicate for future grandchildren. Because if there's one thing that is a big deal for grandparents, it's fairness. And I don't think you're going to want to find yourself having given a lot of money to the earlier grandkids only to be unable to sustain that gift giving in future years. And in fact, that's the second point. Make sure that whatever financial support you provide to grandkids does not interfere with your own financial security. If you wanna make sure that you're giving in the best way and in amounts that you can truly afford, talk with a financial advisor. To pay for your child's college education, you should Save in a 529 plan. I do a lot of seminars around the country and one of the most fun elements are the Q&A sessions. Here's one really interesting question we recently had. I've heard you state that you believe in carrying a large market for 30 years. Uh, I personally think that it's better to pay off a mortgage. Tell me what's the advantage of each. So I believe that you should carry a big long mortgage 30 years and you believe that you shouldn't. Right. Go to your room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna boil it all down to just one reason. In fact, just one single word of why I want you to carry a big long mortgage. Liquidity. Has anybody ever come upon somebody who's house rich and cash poor? Someone who's living in that house and they're making the mortgage payment and they don't have any other money. They're not contributing to the retirement plan. They've got some credit card debt. The house isn't even fully furnished. They can't remember the last time they bought a new car or even went on vacation. But they got this house. And the problem is because they have bought a house that is simply too expensive for their situation. Right. The mortgage is a smokescreen. Everybody thinks that the crisis we had in 2008 with the mortgage crisis was a result of mortgages. It wasn't. The problem was re resulted from people who simply bought houses that they couldn't afford. The mortgage w had nothing to do with it. Whether they had paid cash for it or got a big mortgage, they were going to lose that house anyway as soon as they lost their job. The key, though, is this. The longer the mortgage, the smaller the mortgage payment. In other words, a 30-year loan has a lower monthly payment than a 15-year loan. Mm -hmm. And the lower monthly payment is more affordable. And because it's more affordable, it enables you to divert more of your cash to savings and investments. College, retirement, furniture, clothes, food. So that if you somehow lose your job, you now have a piggy bank of available cash because you didn't tie up every available dollar to making mortgage payments. So the number one reason that I want you to carry a mortgage, a big mortgage, is because the bigger the mortgage, the smaller the down payment you made which enabled you to keep your cash. And the bigger the mortgage, the, bigger, the longer term it is, the smaller the monthly payment. A 30-year loan is a smaller payment than a 15-year loan, which is easier to handle on that basis. I know, though, why you want to pay off the loan, why you like a 15-year loan, because it feels good. Right. Right? You just right. love the idea of owning your home outright. 
the American dream. We all love that notion. My mom still brags about the mortgage burning party that she had. So you should have seen a reaction when I made a refinance. <laughs> The notion of owning your home outright is a wonderful dream, but you know what? That's all it is. It's a dream. It makes sense to do everything you can to pay off that loan if you have absolutely nothing else going on in your life. If you don't have kids that you're trying to raise, if you don't have retirement that you're trying to save for, if you don't have debts you're trying to eliminate, then sure, take every available dollar and use it to pay off the loan. But if you're trying to raise children, if you're trying to save for retirement, if you're trying to pay off other debts, then diverting all of that money to paying off the mortgage is very, very dangerous because what happens if you lose your job? You won't have any cash. And without any cash, you can't put food on the table, you can't make your mortgage payment, yeah. no matter what size that mortgage payment. So liquidity is the most powerful reason that I want you to carry a mortgage. Now because of that, if Bill Gates said to me, that he felt as you did, and he would like to pay off his mortgage, who cares? No problem. In other words, if you're wealthy enough to pay off the loan, and it doesn't interfere with your liquidity, well then okay, go ahead, pay off the loan, it doesn't matter. But we find that for most Americans, we're not Bill Gates. <laughs> wondering how the changes in the healthcare system will make uh, long-term care insurance more available to people with uh, pre-existing conditions. And for those folks that, again, with pre-existing conditions that may not have been able to get uh, long-term care insurance, what other suggestions do you have for long-term care? We're very, very concerned about long-term care. Uh, there is no question that the statistics are working against us. Already in this country, the statistics are that one out of two Americans over the age of 65 are going to require long-term care services at some point in their life. The average annual cost in this country is about $250 per day. That cost is not covered by Medicare, it is not covered by Social Security, and it's not covered by your health insurance. It is therefore no surprise that long-term care costs are the leading cause of poverty among retirees. The new health care legislation that has been undergoing a series of changes over the past several years does not make this picture any easier. In fact, it makes it even more difficult. Several of the biggest insurance companies in America have recently stopped selling long-term care insurance. Metropolitan Life, one of the notables, after 25 years in that business, suddenly decided to quit when they realized they couldn't make any money in that business. So we are recognizing the incredible importance of long-term care. We believe it's an essential part of estate planning, quite frankly, and are encouraging our clients to obtain long-term care insurance at surprisingly young ages. Guess what age it is that we first begin to tell our clients that they should begin to consider long-term care insurance? What age would you guess we first begin talking about it? 35. Age 35, you're close. Age, age 18. <laughs> We are now regarding long-term care insurance as so fundamentally important, and there are two huge reasons we talk about it with people in their 20s. Number one is this. The younger you are when you buy it, the cheaper it is over the course of your lifetime. Second, the younger you are when you buy it, the healthier you are. 20% of all the people who try to buy long-term care insurance are denied coverage. Why? because of a medical condition. If you discover that the, you are unable to buy long-term care insurance because of either pre-existing conditions or a lack of affordability, then we need to look at self-insurance. Uh, we need to look at alternative money management strategies that can help preserve the family's wealth while securing the ability to get the coverage that you need. So if you have a pre-existing condition, make sure you talk with a financial advisor right now. But let me add one other final point to this. Do not assume that you really do have a disqualifying medical condition. Because the long-term care insurance industry looks at health very differently than the life insurance industry. You might be declined for life insurance. That does not mean you will be declined for long-term care insurance. Wonderful case in point, heart conditions. If you have a heart condition, no life insurance company will, buy, will sell you a policy. But the long-term care industry couldn't care less. They'd be thrilled if you keeled over. They're worried about rheumatoid arthritis. They're worried about osteoporosis. 
they're worried about Alzheimer's. The long-term care industry is worried about things that don't kill you. So don't assume that you understand whether your pre-existing condition is a disqualifying condition. Talk with an expert, someone who is very familiar with long-term care insurance, and they'll be able to help you figure out if you can obtain the coverage or not. Thank you. I love doing my weekly radio show, even when my dogs, Summer and Vicky, try to take over. Summer has jumped up onto the high chair and has taken over the place. And she so looks very comfortable, by the way. <laughs> She's very content. <laughs> Vicky won't shut up. Um, <laughs> off to uh, Annandale. Terry, welcome to the program. How are you? Terrific. How are you guys doing? Very well, thank you. Listen, I'm um, hoping that you have correct information on a rumor that's flying about. Uh, hidden in the Obamacare bill is a provision to help fund it that will tax uh, unearned income at three and a half or three point eight percent. That would, you know, mean that extra cost when you sell your house and you uh, hopefully can uh, draw some equity out of it. Let's and, talk about that. Yeah, uh, Terry, you mentioned a new tax in the health care law that becomes effective in 2012. That's not true, but it is true that there's a new tax that takes effect in 2013. Here's how it works: the tax is on hi high income households. And so if you're uh, an individual and you make more than $200,000, or if you're a married couple and you make more than $250,000, there's a new 3.8% Medicare tax on investment income. So well, it define, is true that it exists. Define investment income. Investment income is the sale of real estate, the sale of stocks and bonds, or a capital asset. Now, here's where the confusion comes to play, though, because a lot of times on the Internet it says if you sell your house, you're going to have this 3.8% tax. But the $250,000 or $500,000 exclusion still applies. So, if, Terry, if you're married and you sell your house, you still get $500,000 of profit tax-free before this 3.8% tax might apply. Does that make sense? So what it really comes down to is that the tax is on all assets, not just stocks and bonds and mutual funds, but also real estate. That's right. It's applicable in 2013, unless Congress takes action between now and then. Uh, and it's applicable only for people who have adjusted gross incomes above... Of two hundred thousand dollars if you're an individual, two fifty if you're married. Okay. And on the real estate, and this is where I keep getting the question: you still get that exclusion amount. So you still have the five hundred thousand right. dollars if you're married exclusion on the real estate. So uh, Terry, yes, it's not a rumor; it is in the law, and we're going to have to wait and see if the law is going to get changed. There's a guy running around the country who's saying that the U.S. government has too much debt and it's unsustainable and could wreck the American economy. A lot of folks are saying that, but this particular gentleman has some credibility behind him. He's David Walker, former Controller General of the Government Accountability Office. That's the independent auditor of the U.S. Congress. And he says that we need to be paying a lot of attention to what's going on with federal spending, as well as spending at the state and local level. We had a jam-packed interview with David on a prior show. So much info, we couldn't bring it all to you all at once. So here now is part two of my conversation with David Walker. What the American people need to understand is the government's grown too big, promised too much, waited too long to restructure at all levels. It's going to have to restructure, either voluntarily or it's going to be forced by the markets to do that. Let's bring that down to the pocketbook. What should folks do who are watching this saying, holy haddocks, I haven't been really paying a lot of attention to this, and we've now got some serious issues. What does this mean? How do we translate this, David, into their own investment strategy? What should people be doing with their money? Should they be running for the hills, burying gold in their backyard? What, what, what are we saying to people from a invest, personal investment strategy perspective? The younger you are, uh, the better off you are financially, the more you're going to be affected by the coming restructuring. With regard to investments, you have to look at the fact that you have to look more towards international investments. You have to think very carefully about whether or not you want to go long with regard to uh, debt obligations. Long, meaning long-term maturities. Correct. Because if interest rates go up, you're obviously going to be affected by that. You have to think about whether or not you're going to have a portion of your 
uh, of your investment portfolio and things that are hedged against inflation, if you will. So you can continue to invest, you can continue to own your investments, you can continue to save for your future. Yes, you'll still be able to retire. It might not be as easy as it was or as easy as we'd hoped, but the world is not coming to an end. And I think that message, tell me if, if I'm correct in summarizing what your point is. Is that, is that A, that's correct, and B, it's consistent with what I'm doing myself. Okay. I mean, I like to lead by example and practice what I preach. And let me come back to one thing before I get to the citizenship that you talked about. Look, the mortgage-related subprime crises, the four things that caused that, which woke people up, exist for the federal government's own finances. A disconnect between who benefits from prevailing policies and practices and who bears the risk will pay the price at the bubble burst. Inadequate transparency is the nature and extent and magnitude of the real risk. Too much debt, not enough focus on cash flow and over-reliance on credit ratings. And a failure of governance, oversight, and risk management functions to act until there was a crisis. There are two big differences. The federal government's financial problem is much bigger, and nobody's going to bail out America. Uh -huh. So we have to solve some problems. And, and as you said, people need to plan, save, invest, preserve for retirement. They're probably going to have to work longer, especially if you're younger. But we're going to need them to work longer in order to be able to have enough workforce to generate economic growth in a service and knowledge-based economy. Okay, so I can take a uh, deep sigh of relief. You can too because the world's not coming to an end, my mutual funds aren't going to be worthless, and my ability to get my kid into college is still available, and my ability to retire in comfort is still available. Great. I'm happy to take a pause on that for the moment. Now, let's address the other very fundamental issue. Even though we can still achieve our goals, it'll be harder, it'll take more work, more effort, maybe have to work longer, we can still get there. but. We still need to address these issues. We can, and that's the citizenship part right. that you want to address. What do we need to do as citizens, as voters, what do we need to do? What action should we be taking? As we talked about before, Washington is a lag indicator. Elected officials tend to not make tough choices unless there's a crisis at the doorstep. That's what happened with the mortgage-related subprime crisis. We must not allow that to happen with our nation's finances, because if it does happen, it could have catastrophic consequences here and around the world. And so therefore, the first three words of the Constitution have to come alive. The American people have to become more informed and more engaged. They need to start putting pressure on their elected officials to start making tough decisions in this area to avoid a crisis. They need to make it safe to be able to make those decisions without them automatically losing their job. In effect, what they need to do is to make the political price associated with doing nothing greater than the political price associated with doing something that might involve some tough choices sooner rather than later, but will help us avoid a crisis, phase things in over time, and avoid draconian changes. So as we enter the next political season, the next election campaign season, we need to be asking very pointed question of the candidates, of their views of the debt and the deficit, what strategies they would recommend, and are they willing to place spending reduction ahead of the game that we've been playing over the past 20, 30 years. Correct. And do they have a plan? And does the plan pass a basic math test? You know, there's a new four-letter word in Washington. It's called math. <laughs> you know, the United States is not top 25 in the world in math. It's not top 100 in Washington. In order to have, to, to solve a problem, you need to have a plan. The math has to work. And you've got to be able to get 50% plus one vote in the House, 60% in the Senate, and a presidential signature. And so the question is, push your elected officials, what's the plan? Does it meet those tests? And if it doesn't, they're part of the problem, not part of the solution. And we need to keep that in mind come election day. Uh, you've left the government. Um, you now have created your own organization focusing on this, and that's... The Comeback America Initiative. Describe real briefly the, the primary focus and mission of, of that organization. Fiscal responsibility and sustainability at the federal, state, and local level. It's a full-time job, and I need all the help I can get. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll bet that that's true. Uh, David Walker, thank you so much for joining it's us today. It's a pleasure thank you. be with you, Rick. Thank you very much. I'm Rick Edelman. Stay with us for more. Before we go, I hold the key to your happiness. Well, 
according to one industry survey anyway. If you want to become happy, get a financial plan. Baby boomers who have a financial plan are twice as likely to say that they're happy than people who don't have a plan. Oh, it's not the plan itself, of course, that makes people happier. It's the peace of mind you get from knowing where you're headed and knowing that you have a plan for getting there. Boomers who have a financial plan know what their future will look like and how they'll get there. So don't worry, be happy. Get a financial plan. It'll put a smile on your face. And that's the truth about money. I'm Rick Edelman. Thanks for watching.